Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable at the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. Today it is Sunday, March 5th, 2017. Uh, our subject is man, golden text, Proverbs 20. The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Uh, before we get too far into the lesson, there was something I wanted. Elsie, Elsie, are you ready? I'm ready. Good. Elsie's going to read us something. She'd read part of it uh, a week or so ago about unauthorized literature. This was something she'd had from the bookmark from 1998. Is that right, Elsie? That's correct. And we're not sure who wrote it. We think it might have been Ann Beale, who owns the book. Mark, it sounds, you know, that she had well researched it. So go ahead, Elsie. It's entitled Mrs. Eddy's Stand on Authorized Literature. I consider my students as capable individually of selecting their own reading material and circulating it as a committee would be, which is chosen for this purpose, Mary Baker Eddy. <clears throat> the statement by Mrs. Eddy quoted a was on a card by which she had inserted the Christian Science Journal of July 1891. It was intended to prevent the policy of authorized literature from developing in the Christian Science movement. In May of that year, the journal announced the formation of a new group calling itself the General Association for Dispensing Christian Science literature. This association was intended to be a highly organized national committee for selecting and distributing literature on Christian science. Discerning in it the seeds of authorized literature, Mrs. Eddy wrote a letter to William G. Nixon, editor of the journal, reprimanding him for publishing this announcement and saying that she had given God's word to the world, not to a privileged monopoly to tyrannize other over other writers. And that can be found in Mary Baker Eddy's Six Days of Revelation. The, Ju the July Journal had been printed and bound before Mrs. Eddy learned of the plan for this association. She held up its distribution until she could include a card that warned against the formation of it. The card was printed on a single page and inserted just inside the front cover, which accounts for the fact that it is now missing from many of the bound volumes in the Christian Science Reading Room. The association was disbanded, and no further attempt was made to censor the reading material of Christian scientists, so long as Mrs. Eddy was here. But in 1915, five years after her passing, the Christian Science Board of Directors initiated the policy of authorized literature and began to control the reading material of church members. The director's defiance of Mrs. Eddy's stand regarding such censorship brought about the very thing she tried to prevent a monopoly that has tyrannized even the best writers in the church. Through this monopoly, some of the finest works on Christian science have been suppressed over years, and Christian scientists have been deprived of profound teaching that would have been invaluable to their healing work. Only in recent years has there been an awakening within the movement to the great harm that has come through a church policy that belongs more to the Dark Ages than to the 20th century. An increasing number of Christian scientists are beginning to realize that it has been a major factor in the decline of the church. Although our leader's published writings represent her complete revelation, her more specific teachings on how to demonstrate Christian science, are often found in her letters, articles, and written instructions to students. 
We also find her inspired teaching in the records, writings, and memoirs of her students. So long as such powerful teaching was passed on to others through class teaching and association, the movement prospered and its healing works equaled those of early Christianity. But as the early teachers and their students left the scene, so did the dynamic teaching and healing that had prospered the movement. Fortunately, through the unauthorized writings of Mrs. Eddy, her students, and others, these early teachings have been preserved, and today they are being published by independent Christian scientists. The writings of contemporary scientists, writings independently of the organization, are also exploring the more profound aspects of Mrs. Eddy's discovery. Based on science and health, they help us to understand better the whole of Christian science and how to demonstrate the full potential of its healing. That's it. Thank you very much, Elsie. Mm -hmm. This will be in our next, um, our March Liberator magazine under history. It's very important. Um, part of our roundtable is re-educating and teaching, and it's very important, you know, the, the correct history of our movement. Mrs. Eddy has said it's important. That's what you look for in a, someone to help you, a practitioner, someone who knows the history. Um, because this is this all goes along with our lesson on integrity, on honesty, and it's it's uh, so important that we remain honest and true to God, our leader, certainly. And so, Florence, tell us what your experience was recently. Oh, I just heard from someone who said that they were working with a practitioner, and when they mentioned um, that they were reading Martha Wilcox, the comment was to such literature need to be put in the trash. And I was shocked by it because I really, I know that there's opposition to anything that's not in the reading room, but those words were rather um, alarming to me. And they also said that it referred to those writings as being stolen and I don't know exactly what they mean, whether they mean these writers like Bicknell Young, um, Kimball, and all those uh, Eustace have stolen from Mrs. Eddy or not. But if that's what they mean, that's just nonsense because they are referring constantly to where it all came from. And, you know, it can be anything but just evil working not to get the, you know, Christian scientists to actually really practice Christian science the way Mr. Seddy taught it. Absolutely. And what I have heard, um, and I forget which teacher it was, but someone uh, told me that they realized that their authorized teacher was teaching, in fact, from Bicknell Young and not giving him any credit. I mean, obviously, he had read Bicknell Young's um, association addresses with teaching from it and yet not letting his, whoever they are, students know. This is a dishonesty, and this dishonesty is, is we're going to get into it, how you lose, you forfeit divine help. You, as, as much as you live and move and breathe, you remain honest to your highest principle. Do you want to say something? Well, not only does it speak to the question, the question of honesty in that particular case, but the the... Uh, the policy itself, what, what, what is wrong with the policy in and of itself? Why is that policy so wrong? It's human domination. Exactly. It's the belief that I know better than you do what's right for you. That you can't have a good relationship with God and I have to intervene. So it's metaphysically incorrect. It goes to um, Jeremy, what he wrote on the forum. Yeah, I was thinking a lot of that after last week's false prophet talk. 
about how, you know, that basic assumption that people aren't, have, you know, original sin or just basically not good and they need to go against their nature to be good and we have to show them how because there are so many systems that are in place for that. Maybe all systems are in place for that assumption. Yes, very much so. So, I mean, and here, certainly in the United States, we, we are used to freedom. And uh, don't tell me what I'm going to read. I mean, that is just, you just don't do that. <laughs> and, yet, and yet here they are doing that. They are telling you what to read and what not to read. And you should be able to decide for yourself whether it is helpful or how, by the way you feel from it. And certainly these early workers that knew Mrs. Eddy, you think that Carpenter didn't want his books to be out? I mean, my gosh, they, they gave their lives to get it out. Now, I just happened to come across something that goes along with that this, this week. So I figure God wanted it said. This is a little pamphlet. Maybe some of you had it. have it. We've gotten it years ago. It's called The Overwhelming Evidence Concerning Spiritual Healing Through Mary Baker Eddy. And it is by someone called Ralph B. Spencer. <laughs> some of you have it? I've seen it. Seen I it. think okay. I might have it. Well, we, yeah, it is in our store. It is in our store, yes. We publish it. Now, Ralph B. Spencer was a good friend of, of Gilbert Carpenter. In the beginning, it said he uh, used to play billiards with him. He, he says he was never a member of the church, and at first he certainly uh, questioned, I mean, Mary Baker Eddy and some of the things that she said. How could she say these seeming so radical things? But I'm sure through his friendship with Carpenter and in, through reading the, her textbook, he decided that she was really the revelator. And what she gave us was astounding and had to have great reverence for it. So in this little book, he writes a few things about church and organization, and he also writes these many of the healings that Mrs. Eddy had that is proof of, well, who and what she is, because you cannot deny her healing work. But there is one page I thought was interesting, one and a half, and it, I'm getting an echo. So if, if you turned on your Internet, please turn it off. Anyway, um, it, it goes along with our story this week about the early Christians. Um, this is called A Christly Period, Always Followed by the Antichrist. Mrs. Eddy healed instantaneously a great many people, even as did Jesus. She spoke the living truth so clearly and with so much of the divine spirit that people were not only healed, but were regenerated even as with Jesus. Yet, her words and the spirit of them were not accepted by the vast majority of Christians, even as Jesus' words and the spirit of them were not accepted by the Jews. Within 300 years following Jesus' dispensation, the light had almost gone out, spiritual healing had largely disappeared, and the dark ages of materialism had begun to move in and discredit the words and accomplishments of the great Messiah. Within 30 years, following Mrs. Eddy's dispensation, the light had almost gone out. Spiritual healings had largely disappeared and the dark age of the second Antichrist period began to move in and discredit the words and accomplishments of the second coming of the Christ spirit. The second coming had been prophesied by both St. John and by Jesus, and it came as prophesied. We might say that it appeared in four steps or phases, those of 1844, 1866, 1875, and the one to come, because this was written a while ago, possibly in 1977. Throughout the last third of the previous century, it continued to grow clearer and clearer, and its effectiveness became more widely acknowledged. Soon after Mrs. Eddy passed in 1910, the Antichrist period very slowly and subtly began its infiltration and brainwashing. 
It had been clearly prophesied by both John and Jesus and also by Mrs. Eddy. An Antichrist period may also be designated as a hate period. So it goes along with what Elsie just read. They forbade, they, they were from the very get-go began disobeying Mrs. Eddy, disobeying the manual, forbidding books, and it, it created, uh, yes, the Antichrist. Now those dates, I didn't research, maybe some of you know, 1844, 1866, 1875, I mean, some of that is the writing of Science and Health. But then, possibly in 1977, we, that always arrested our attention because guess what happened in 1977? The law case was initiated. Yeah, we were excommunicated then. We were set free then and attacked by the board of directors in Boston with a lawsuit that was intended to bankrupt us. Wow. So if anything else happened in 1977, I'd be interested, <laughs> but it was just an amazing date. And this was prophesied by him, and this was written, you know, before 1977, way before. And it says, if you, I guess we published this little book, yeah. yeah. It's worth having. It's very interesting. So, so, but that's okay. The line of light, is, as Eustace calls it, goes on. Somehow the truth keeps uh, taking various forms, getting handed down. It's, I always liken it to the, uh, I don't know a lot about football, but I know, I know that the quarterback throws the ball and, <laughs> and, some, and somebody runs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and sometimes what they do, and this is the only thing I know, is they, they hide it. They pretend that they're not running with it. So no one will tackle them. And that's, you know, we just quietly go on our way, hopefully. <laughs> no one notices what we're doing. <laughs> but those who need to notice, notice. And those who are doing the work are doing the work. And I'm very grateful for that. If anybody's Could looking for that book, you might mention that it's a small size. It's not eight and a half by 11. No, no, it's it, right. It's just a little pamphlet. Yes, yes, a Kids little pamphlet. Yeah, yeah. I would like to speak to the word stolen. <laughs> And the reason I want to speak to that word is having come from the movement and having that term used so that you would not read this material. When they felt they couldn't control what you were reading, they decided to make you afraid of it. And one of the ways that they would address it, and I, I know it because I had it firsthand, was to tell you it was stolen. My interpretation of what they were saying was that <clears throat> it was inappropriately gotten and published, and that because you were not in her class, you had no right to be reading it. And so it was stolen if you were not a direct student. And that they made a big deal about stolen literature. And it even was to the point where if you were caught with your teacher's material on the airport that you didn't go to the class or some other, it was just a big deal. And they would cause a lot of um, havoc over it and make people feel regret or upset or disturbed about having things that they weren't supposed to have. So it was just a way to control and make you afraid. It's the same tactic that the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church uses, isn't it? Fear and ignorance. The same tactic that Islam uses to enslave millions of people. Fear and ignorance. And guilt. And, and guilt. guilt. Right. That's what took me away from the main church was the guild. We had a family practitioner when I was a child, and she would, uh, we would ask her for help, and a couple of days later, he'd get a letter from her. And her letters were outstanding. When I came here, I found out that it was the early workers. He had the books, but um, he never gave them credit. There you are. And she was not honest about it, and she didn't heal. Wow. And when I came here, bingo. <laughs> yes, well, it forfeits the divine help. Yeah. And these, the people, and Mrs. Evans always said that, the people who know uh, that they're not supposed to read it and read it anyway, and I've heard people say that, oh, it's no big deal, read it. No one knows. Everybody reads it. You, nobody yeah, knows. It doesn't exactly make any right. difference. Yeah. Well, that's a dishonest stance. It's, dis it's dishonesty. Be honest, for God's sake. That's what this lesson is very refreshing. 
Be honest. Be who you are and don't pretend to be something you're not. And if in being honest, you can't be a member of the organization, well, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this isn't any this is not in a way of criticism or condemning or anybody. This is just these are facts. These are what we call the rules of the universe, which the lesson is full of. All our lessons are, but this was particularly evident. And uh, so we will get into that in Science and Health. The first, and Gary can read it, number one in Science and Health, the one we talk about. Very number often. one, honesty is spiritual power. Dishonesty is human weakness, which forfeits divine help. That's a law of the universe. I don't care if you don't know anything about Christianity, you don't know the Bible, I don't care where you live or who you are or what religion you think you might be or what religion you despise or you are not. You, you have to be honest. Most people... Because all of us have a conscience, we're born sort of knowing this. What's so great, all, all cultures everywhere know the importance of honesty. But then there are other, there are other, and there are other, this is we spoke about, religions that will cultivate dishonesty. I mean, if you were, are made to feel guilty and you're condemned if you do something wrong, then chances are you're going to try to lie. You're going to teach your children to lie. You're going to teach that that's better to get away with something than to tell the truth. Well, if you're going to feel guilty either way, then <laughs> right. might as well do it the convenient way. <laughs> right. Right. It's, it's all a matter of what you can get away with. Bruce, what did you write about on the forum? Never need to despair of an honest heart. Yes. And I'd like to say something about what you said about dishonesty, it is indeed cultivated. It is abnormal. It is not part of anybody inherently. And, of course, we see it in our grandchildren who, as soon as they see something, they tell it exactly like it is. How could they do <laughs> otherwise? They're naturally honest. And, uh, yes, I did say something about never needing to despair of an honest heart. And... People sometimes hide their honest heart because they're afraid of how other people will take it if they tell it like it is. So people tend to say whatever is going to be convenient or they think they may, might be accepted by others. But that's cowardice. It's cowardice to do, though. You tell the truth just because it is true. Remember where our, our conviction is. It's with our almighty God himself who is truth. And with him, you may find opposition and end up doing things you may not like to do. But you have a clear conscience. <laughs> and you made another good point in that, that uh, you tell the truth even if, even if it means that you're going to look bad. <laughs> Did I tell that <laughs> I had to tell the truth about something one time? Did I put that in my own mind? Yeah. yeah, you did. And yeah. as soon as I had it straight in my mind, okay, I don't care what the consequences are, I'm at least going to be honest. I felt this clarity of mind. I felt that peace. And, uh, and, you, and you were forgiven yeah. for what you did. I was forgiven for what I did. Let me tell the whole story. No. <laughs> it's an interesting story. I'll tell some of you later. Well, and you know, the church that has you go to these confessionals and you confess and then you feel like you get it off your conscience until you do it again. And, it, and so it, it breeds this uh, dishonest sense. And so always tell the truth. And if you think, you know, someone's not going to be your friend if you're not honest or if you don't tell them the truth, that doesn't mean to be cruel by any means, but... but to, to live up to your highest ideals, well, then better not they be your friend. And we see, you know, it's very clear in the Roman Catholic Church that, you know, people, the members are, are taught to be hypocritical. They're encouraged to be hypocritical. Well, 
we're seeing the same thing in the Boston organization, aren't we? Mm -hmm. so people are pressured to be hypocritical. Don't go there. They don't want to go there. No, and I mean people who, if they had a medical experience, I, I know I, I told that story how, you know, you're just made to feel terrible, like you've done some horrible sin. And it just, it makes no sense. That's not Christian. Anyone else who wants to either say anything about this or anything we've talked about so far? Tell something about what happened when I went to confessional one time. Huh? <laughs> okay. When I, was, when I was young, my mom used to bring us to the Catholic Church, and uh, we always had to line up against the wall and wait our turn and go into the confessional. So I remember one time I went in and I told the priest about what was going on in our household, and he turned it around on me and said that I must have done something bad and that I was to do all these Hail Marys and Our Fathers, like five Hail Marys or something like that. So after I left the professional, of course I had to kneel down and do my penance. And I remember one of my family members saying that, oh, well, you must have done something really bad because you had you were on your knees for a long time. And uh, I remember saying to them, yeah, I told the truth. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I just, I just recalled that from something that happened a long time ago. Well, thank you. And God never forgot that. No, and God has brought you here. But this is from... This is a child speaking about an abusive home, so that that is that is very wicked and cruel. Yeah. What about kicking somebody when they're down? Mm -hmm. Well, and here you were needing, crying out for help. So keeps them in control. Well, that's true. Uh, I, and then and then and then we know too that all all of the abuse that has gone on in that particular church. And other churches, we're not pointing fingers here, it's, it's, and it's not people or religion, but it is the workings of animal magnetism. The workings of animal magnetism that gets into what is supposed to be something good, quote religion, and then turn it into something evil. The Antichrist. So this is where we have to stay awake and alert and not, not allow it to enter into our experience. And we do that by remaining honest. When you're honest, you will attract honest people to you. Once you start to become dishonest, you're going to attract you know, all kinds of weird people to you because it's just your, in your thinking. And then you're going to get yourself into just a big mess, the Adam dream. And you're going to wonder why everyone is always doing you wrong and mistreating you and all of this. Well, check your own thought. Are you being dishonest? Sometimes I was very dishonest with myself um, as a Christian scientist because I was always denying that I was having problems. I thought that was Christian science. Not Christian science. Until, until you read <laughs> Or in the unauthorized literature, <laughs> that Mrs. Eddy told one of her students to tell the truth the about the lie. lie. Yes, thank you. It's on our website now. Because <laughs> what's that story? You no, know, is it Jeremy? You know? About telling the truth about the lie? Yeah. Oh, the, the lady was trying to pretend that she did not have a cold. Right. Mrs. Eddy was not having any of that. She <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> obviously someone, had a cold. No, it was someone in Mrs. Eddy's household working for her. and. She came in to see Mrs. Eddy, and Mrs. Eddy asked her how she was. She said, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> and Mrs. Eddy rebuked her. Told her to tell the truth about the lie. And so we must. That's nailing it. 
don't, you know it's a lie, you know it isn't the truth, but you have to say, okay, well, I seem to be having this problem. There's nothing worse, you know, when people, so-called Christian scientists, I mean, they go to work, they're obviously in all kinds of pain or whatever, and the person says, oh, are you all right? Can I help you? Oh, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's great. <laughs> when it's not. When it's not. You can just say, be honest, say, well, I... I'm having a problem with something right now, but don't lie. Okay, I would like someone to read. First, you read number three, please. The spiritual sense of truth must be gained before truth can be understood. This sense is assimilated only as we are honest, unselfish, loving, and meek. In the soil of an honest and good heart, the seed must be sown, else it beareth not much fruit, for the swinish element in human nature uproots it. Thank you. Okay, we talk a lot about spiritual sense and how important it is to have spiritual sense. What does it mean to assimilate? To assume, to assume the mere appearance of something without the reality. So it's really just imagining. Mm -hmm. no, no, I, not think so. I think it's no, like no. when you take in food and it becomes part of you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No. Assimilated. It's a different it word. Becomes, oh, thank you. Whatever. It becomes you. Becomes you. you. Yeah. This is, yeah. It's, it becomes you. It's not anything assumed. It becomes you. To bring to likeness, to cause to resemble. Yes. Just as you assimilate your food. You become it, so to speak. Okay. Yeah, which is right. <laughs> and you are what you think, they say. So, okay, so so you want to have spiritual sense. How are you going to get it? So you don't have it and you want it. You can start by being honest. Yes, you can. Take the next step, being unselfish. Yes. Then you can take the third step, be loving. And then there's another step. Meek. Thank you. Well, absolutely. Because in assimilating it, you must desire it and, and ask God for it and want it with all your heart, mind, and soul. But you can't obtain it in any other way. There are no shortcuts. You can't fake it. So, honest. I looked up these definitions. Upright, just, fair, free from trickishness and fraud. And proceeding from pure and just principles, God's principles. Unselfish, not unduly attached to one's own self-interest. Not influenced in actions by a view to a private advantage. This one is important. They're up to all of them, extremely important, but unselfish. When you're always thinking about yourself, everything, how it all relates to you, and there are people that are like that. Everything relates to them. If you're having a conversation, it's all about them, or how conversation doesn't apply to them, or all about them, me, me, myself, and I. Now that other, not influenced in actions by a view to a private advantage. What does that mean? You're going to benefit from something? Yes. How it means I get. Go ahead. How it fits your agenda? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it means, it can also mean, I get more joy out of seeing another good, another one, another person have something good than I do out of getting something good myself. That's what it, that's what unselfish should mean, yes. Yeah. That's how you feel about someone that you love. You want more for them than you do for yourself. Part of a feeling of love. But this, the other idea of, of yes, trying to get something from it, that you have always an ulterior motive. 
And I'm bringing all this up because we see it now. It's been paraded everywhere in the news and politics and government, all of this stuff that we're going to rip it to shreds and throw it in the garbage is not of God. And all it can do is sell anyone who, who acts in these matters who are doing anything for their own advantage, for their selfish advantage, and maybe trying to make it seem good. And it can also work in another way. When perhaps you are just maybe quietly trying to do something good, the best that you know how, and what could happen. You get accused of doing something that you hadn't even dreamed of doing. And, and I will give my classic example of years ago, someone said to me or Gary and I, or well anyway, they, their take on the reason that the few of us who were still left at Plainfield, the reason that we were still here was why. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is bizarre. Yeah, there was someone who actually thought that the reason we stuck around in this church was so that when Mrs. Eddie passed on, Mrs. we Evans. Could, or Mrs. Evans passed on, we were going to sell the church and divide up the money. That's what that's what was thought. Now, when I heard that, I was in such a state of shock that had never ever occurred to me. You mean I waited? I did all this just to get money to sell this beloved church? But what did it show about that person? That is what they would That's look what like they to them. Yeah. That's what was in their thinking. That's where they say it takes one to know one. Yes. <laughs> and my grandmother used to say, and I think it's Plato or something, what thou seest, that thou beest. And Mrs. Eddy said that on the uh, balcony of the of Pleasant View. But I, I bring that out because I, now that is <laughs> some of my Southerners, Elsie, some who live in the South, they talk about, and my mother used to say it too, ugly, ugly, ugly. And God don't love ugly. <laughs> ugly thinking. It's very, very ugly. There's no other word for it. And people who act this way are ugly. Their actions are ugly, and their face is ugly, too. That's just the way it is, because they're hateful and selfish. It's a very ugly part of mortal mind. And I, I never experienced this so much, but I did go through a time when I was accused of things I had never, ever thought of doing. And all I could think of was, wow, that is in their thinking. That's what they would do. Because as you grow in, in Christ's truth, you will become more sensitive to things that truly aren't right. But not not to do this ugly thing where you accuse people falsely, and uh, that that is just um, anything but the man of integrity. <laughs> okay. So from a spirit of criticism, and that is what you're supposed to. Right. It is gossip. Spirit, gossip, criticism, no healing. They're deliberately making someone's good works look bad, deliberately, to trip them up, to make them look terrible, as, as Christ is an example, certainly Mary Baker Eddy. So. But that's what mortal mind does. It, it, it tears other people down to try to build itself up. Yeah, that's what it does. But I finally wanted to 
kill Christ. I mean, they absolutely had to kill Christ. They did. They did, because they were so outraged with that. Because otherwise they were going to keep on seeing all the good that he was doing. That's it. No, that's it. So, you know, judge righteous judgment um, is most important. And only God tells us, and this is the spiritual sense we're developing, honest, unselfish, loving, we went into quite a bit yesterday, and then meek, and one of the things about meekness is submissive to the divine will, humility. So as you live these things, as you live them, you will have more and more spiritual sense. Um, and, and people will be jealous of it, and then they will construe things that you do, perhaps. I want to give you now, before, this is a beautiful, beautiful prayer that Carson sent to me, Bob in Colorado. And it goes within the Bible, and it says that about, but he shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This is a prayer that Mrs. Eddy gave at the Massachusetts Metaphysical College. I will, we were going to put it in the next Liberator, because you all should have it in your heart to keep yourselves pure from the corruption of the world. And this is what Mrs. Eddy says. Oh, my God, I offer as a consecrated gift upon thine altar a heart dedicated to thy service lips speaking only words of charity, love, and truth, thoughts striving to be only the true thoughts of the mind of God. Help me to endure unto the end, strong in the faith, powerful in the truth. All the influence that I can bring to bear, all the force of tongue or pen that is mine, I offer in thy service. May heaven help consecrate and accept. That is a prayer to have in your heart, to keep yourself pure and to keep yourself full of the integrity of the Christ. So there are many more things here that are rules and laws of the universe. One, the wrong done another reacts most heavily against oneself. So don't even try to think that you can trip somebody else up and that it's not going to come back on you. That's a law and rule of the universe. The sinner makes his own hell by doing evil and the saint his own heaven by doing right. You're going to indulge in hellish thinking and, and all of that. You will make your own hell. There's not a thing that can be done about it until, until you begin to think the thoughts of God, to say that prayer, as Mrs. Eddy said. Elizabeth, I'd like you, could you just tell us, I thought your forum remarks was very helpful. Okay, do you want me to read it? Yes. Okay. Um, from the lesson, in Isaiah we read, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. This is where the spiritual understanding of the scriptures is so important. And now that I'm beginning to understand better the spiritual interpretation, it has opened my eyes to passages I used to gloss over because I wasn't awake. How does the Lord create evil? If you read the Bible literally, that's how it would be interpreted. And when I looked at the online Bible commentaries on this passage, they all explain the evil part as God's punishment, old theology. But Mrs. Eddy explains that, quote, the prophet referred to divine law as stirring up the belief in evil to its utmost when bringing it to the surface and reducing it to its common denominator, nothingness. The muddy riverbed must be stirred in order to purify the stream. In moral chemicalization, when the symptoms of evil illusion are aggravated, we may think in our ignorance that the Lord hath wrought an evil, but we ought to know that God's law 
uncover so-called sin and its effects, only that truth may annihilate all sense of evil and all power to sin, end quote. It would be very depressing to believe that God creates evil. No, God's law uncovers the evil so it can be annihilated. Thank you. A very, very another basic principle, rule and law of the universe, that must be understood by scientists, and yet many don't understand it. They, I don't know if they haven't read the textbook, obviously. It comes out only to be healed. It destroys itself. If, if you see things that are going on now that seem troubling, this lesson says, let, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be troubled by these things. They're coming out to be healed and destroyed. And the era being uncovered, it will destroy itself because you'll see it for what it is. And this is why, in your own life, you must never be afraid to let the era come out to the surface. I, after her quote on the forum, I quoted Mrs. Eddy about era uncovered is third. and the third. final third destroys itself. And Mrs. Eddy says, what is the purpose of the serpent? What does it do? To hide itself. Thank you. Hides itself. So, if there's anything in you that you want to hide, then question it. You see, Ananias and Sapphira, they were hiding a lot in their home, weren't they? What did you say yesterday, Sharon? Is that was um, what the Sevens used to call behind closed doors. <clears throat> they kept it within themselves, and they never uncovered what was really going on. Yes. So don't hide things. Let it out. That doesn't mean you. There's another saying about airing your dirty laundry all over the place. <laughs> I, I know. According, I, I'm not on Facebook, but sometimes my daughter will say, "Ma, all these people are airing their dirty laundry. We don't need to hear all this stuff like that." But you, you bring it out in, in a way to. Uh, you don't have to broadcast it to the world. No, no. You bring it up to a practitioner or some other person you can trust. Come up to be healed. Um, revealed and healed. Very important. And this is this is the difference between a practicing science and one who is just ignoring all the error and not um, peace, 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 peace. Yeah. Yes. Pretending. Now, anyone else before we conclude? Anyone with any questions or there are many more in this lesson. Go ahead. This last point is so huge because the prevailing thinking out there is that if you're addicted to drugs, you're always addicted. If you're an alcoholic, you could never be healed. There are incurable diseases that, oh, that's just the way that person is. It's, it's like evil is a, is a foregone conclusion and there's nothing you can do about it and we just have to live with it. and you know, yada, 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 whereas this says, no, it will be annihilated. And, I mean, this is why this is radical, because we don't make friends with evil. We seek to destroy it, and that is the battle raging, whereas the prevalent thought is we have to live with it, and we can do our best to, like, you know, hide it or, but it's always going to be there. So, I mean, this is, this is a huge point. That's, you know, what differ, differentiates Christian science from old theology. Absolutely it is. And it's wonderful. Thank God for it. When you understand it, it's a power and a strength. And you never fear it the way you once did when you're just trying so hard to cover it up and in the meantime terrified of it. We're going to end with, in miscellaneous writings, Gary's going to read about the man of integrity. Before he does that, I just, some of you don't know, starting today, we, we're having a change of um, notice operandi the, for the readers on Sunday. We're going to do more what we've done on Wednesday, where we have, um, yeah, alternate a little variety of readers. So today, um, Gary reads the Bible and Lawrence is reading Science and Health next week. It'll be a, a different combination. And it, we're going to try to always have one person in Plainfield and one person out of town. So anyway, we will uh, be supporting that with our
sprayers. Go ahead. This is from Miscellaneous Writings, page 147. The man of integrity is one who makes it his constant rule to follow the road of duty, according as truth and the voice of his conscience pointed out to him. He is not guided merely by affection, which may sometimes give the color of virtue to a loose and unstable character. The upright man is guided by a fixed principle, which destines him to do nothing but what is honorable and to abhor whatever is base or unworthy. Hence we find him ever the same, at all times the trusty friend, the affectionate relative, the conscientious man of business, the pious worker, the public-spirited citizen. He assumes no borrowed appearance. He seeks no mask to cover him, for he acts no studied part, but he is indeed what he appears to be, full of truth, candor, and humanity. In all his pursuits, he knows no path but the fair, open, and direct one, and would much rather fail of success than attain it by reproachable means. He never shows us a smiling countenance while he meditates evil against us in his heart. We shall never find one part of his character at variance with another. Lovingly yours, Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you. So work with that, live with that, be that. If you don't know that, learn to know it. Work with it often. I also want to thank Fairley and Florence for doing a superb job reading every week, every Sunday for two years. They did a wonderful, wonderful job. And I'm, we are all so grateful for that. And we work to know that we keep that high standard. <laughs> So, so thank you all for joining today, and we will pray now for a powerful service. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.